That's great. So what are the, the stuff that's on your plate currently? Oh, uh, so quite a bit. Um, uh, a lot of the work obviously is H1B related because that's the target that the agency has got right now. And their uh, dark little hearts, they would love to kill the H1B program, especially if you're from India. But we're taking on the employer-employee relationship line of cases from the uh, the agency. We're taking on their requirement that you have to show a specific non-speculative work assignment for the entire duration of the H1B visa when you file. And then also taking on the legality of the agency taking um, discretion to pick how long they're going to give you a visa for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that was an issue. They're assigning I-94s for like two days or some ridiculous stuff like that. Yeah. yeah I've seen them like, and they're post dated too. So you'll get your approval notice when it's already expired. Yeah. Especially for a cap case with consular processing, giving you a one day approval, like you're really going to make it through consular processing do your visa stamp, hop on a plane and show up in a 24 hour period. There's just something about that that strikes everybody as being just patently unreasonable. It's, it's pretty much bad faith. Yeah. Is that an argument? Of well, part of the argument is that they're unlawfully trying to increase the amount of fees that they're receiving mm -hmm. by, if they can force you to file a whole bunch of extension petitions a year, then they increase their revenue substantially, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have to file, you just pay like $3,000 in filing fees and you have to file new filing fees immediately upon getting your approval notice. There's something about that that just smacks people as being wrong. And uh, that, that's part of the argument. Another great piece of work that you <laughs> did is uh, the lawsuit about the change in uh, offsite work, especially for, I think, STEM employees. Could you discuss what, what you did there and the success you had? Yeah, so for those that aren't aware that this USCIS on their website came out without telling anybody. There was no notice, there was no press release. They just came up and said, hey, you can no longer work for a IT consulting company, you know, at an offsite location if you are on STEM OPT. And it's a violation of your student status if you do so. And it was applied retro retroactively. It wasn't in the regulation. There's nothing in the regulation that supports that. And it wasn't even acknowledged by the agency in, for a couple of months. And when some DSO uh, was looking through the website and saw that, you know, contacted, you know, I think it was NAFSA, which is their the trade organization for colleges and universities that do this. And all of a sudden, alarm bells went off and everybody started freaking out that they might have a massive, huge status yeah. violation yeah. problem. And then things started getting denied. And so we, we, the way that it was written was just so explicit and so non-discretionary. It was, you cannot do this. You know, you must do this or you will get a denial or a revocation or be in violation. And the language was so strong and the way it was being applied made it pretty clear that this was essentially a regulation that they created without going through the proper process. So we went into court, we filed a preliminary injunction and the day before the agency had to respond to our preliminary injunction motion, they changed their website back <laughs> and, and eliminated all of the, all of the offending material. And then in, in their brief did not acknowledge the, uh, the fact that the prior version was, was there you know the the offending version that we complained about in our case they completely acted like was not there and didn't even acknowledge it well luckily we had screenshots that we used as exhibits when we filed the complaint but it, it was just it was just hilarious that they were putting their heads in the sand on it they knew their position was so bad they just couldn't defend it so they just said our position is what's on the website now and that's legal and that's lawful and didn't discuss what happened before. Could a judge issue sanctions or something like that for this kind of behavior? So the judge isn't typically going to issue sanctions against a Justice Department attorney unless, you know, they personally done something horrible in a, in a case. Mm -hmm. Now, against the agency, if the agency were to, were to defend that and go, you know, the mattresses, to use a godfather phrase, on that issue, then they would probably get EJA fees because the agency would not have been reasonable in their, their defense of the case and the issue. 
because it's so fair. It, it costs so much money to defend these things just for them to, on a switch, change the website and they put through hell. And I've had, I had a, like cases that were related to this and my clients were freaking out, took so many hours of calling me and just to calm them down. And, and, and so it's, it's, it costs a lot of people money for them to, on a whim, just change rules and change it back like this. I wish there were some, I mean, I'm not familiar with federal litigation and stuff, some bad faith lawsuits you could put on the. Well, that part of what uh, bad faith would be great, but the other issue is, is that the vast majority of the cases that I filed on some of these issues that I think are are winners, mm -hmm. you file the case, and before the government even answers, they reverse their decision, send out approval notices, so you never get a decision. So what they're really doing is they're acknowledging that they're violating the law. They're, you know, approving for those cases that make it to litigation just so they can t continue to violate the law, yeah. right? Yeah. So they're not defending their cases, they're not defending their, their decisions and their analysis. They're banking on the fact that they can roll over in litigation fast enough that no judge will ever see what they're doing. And the vast majority of the people are not gonna sue, are not gonna go into court. And so they have, it's a very low cost option for them to change the way things happen and to, to penalize the H-1B program without really getting a, a bad decision in court. And you've, you've have a strategy to force their hand on this, is that correct, with the recent lawsuit? Yeah, so if, uh, because of this scenario was so common, you'd file and you'd, it would get approved, like clockwork. It would t you know, the government has 60 days to answer the complaint in federal court. And sometime between day one and day 60, these were getting approved. So, the the issue is becomes how do you prove to a court that this is a problem that is capable of rep, repetition yet evading review and that is what lets a court enter a ruling and a decision on a moot case a case that isn't still alive so when the government approves the petition they moot it out so the question becomes how do you make how do you drive that point home to the court so they will see the issue and continue to adjudicate it to prevent future abuses going forward so we've filed 40 cases in a week and said okay there's 40 cases they all looked very very similar and as soon as we did that we got a notice from the court saying we need to talk <laughs> you know everybody get together let's talk how we're going to handle you know this massive number of h1b cases that are alleging the same basic violations. So we ended up consolidating all of those cases into, for lack of a better word, a mini class action case in the District of Columbia. And we're litigating there those three main issues, which is employer-employee relationship, the specific non-speculative work assignment requirement, and also the ability to shorten the approval period that's requested on the H-1. So that is in litigation right now, and our opening brief on that is is uh, being filed shortly.